Our mental health chatbots can help treat symptoms of depression, according to findings from an NTU research team. Now, these apps can interact with people to show empathy and encouragement to improve moods. Now, they can't prevent suicide or provide advice for serious mental issues. So to share more, we have Dr. Laura Martinengo from the Lee Kong Chen School of Medicine in NTU. Uh, Dr. Martinengo, uh, let's first define the parameters of what these bots can and can't do. Okay, so we are talking here about um, apps uh, that can help people um, manage their mental health symptoms. Um, these are uh, apps that kind of uh, can converse with people. It's a machine, it's a computer that produces conversations with a user. Mm. So some of these machines, uh, the user can actually type things. Uh, some other apps will give you options like a multiple choice and you tap on the options to kind of guide you in, in the exercises right. that you are looked at do. nine of these apps. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, and as you just spelled out, there are different options. It could be a menu, it could be typing words, and rather like when you log on to a shopping site or bank and you don't know how to proceed, and you, there's a little thing that pops up on the yep. site. If you could give me one example, one of these nine apps that you studied that you feel was particularly effective or particularly ineffective for whatever reason. Uh, we had um, a we have all the spectrum of, of chatbots, from some that were very, very basic and I would say quite ineffective, to quite effective ones. Uh, for so example... What, what, can you identify one feature that makes this kind of app especially effective? Is there one thing across the board? I would say uh, the variety of exercises they can give the users. And I would say uh, those apps where the user can type things uh, and kind of seem to be more responsive to them and uh, to show a bit more empathy. If I, I think this showing of empathy is important also. Uh, for example, if the user say, I feel very sad, um, the chatbot can respond something like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear you are sad. Uh, what is going on with you? Or, Do you want to share something? Or, mm. Things like that. Um, yeah. yeah. Did, did you find that uh, a certain demographic or a certain uh, particular kind of uh, uh, person uh, responds better to these kind of chatbots? In general, when you see the way the chatbot is kind of talking to mm -hmm. the person, seems to be more orientated to the younger population. Uh, they will use words like buddy or um, WhatsApp or, you know, language that probably the younger people use. Mm. So they seem to be the, the target user group. Now, there's, this is probably the only thing we can say because they are able to, they ask you your name and obviously the system will, re, will uh, remember your name. But there are not many other ways that the chatbot personalize the conversation. This is exactly it. Uh, I'm not the most sophisticated of people, but I think a sophisticated person would think, well, if I see, as you, you give that example, I am sad. The chatbot then replies, oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. How can I help? Uh, that's no different from a shopping site. How on earth can anyone feel better when a chatbot says, I feel bad that you feel sad. I think when you don't feel well, probably even hearing it from a machine helps. Uh, also, sometimes it's, it's very difficult for people with mental health disorders to actually talk about these mm -hmm. things and to mm -hmm. tell to people, I don't feel well. So if this person feel very stigmatized and feel like, it's not easy to talk about these things. To open up to this machine and say, well, mm -hmm. I feel really, really bad today. And to hear something that seems so like... Essentially, what works is that they don't feel it's a person. The only reason they can open up is because they know it's not a person. Um, it could be. 
It could be also that they don't have the person in front of them. So this kind of distance mm. is what gives them the, the ability to actually talk about these things. Yeah, I, I guess a lot of questions come to mind. Uh, first of all, uh, wouldn't the time that you've spent on this and the money, uh, not just you, but other people in this area, digital psychiatry, I believe they call it, wouldn't it be better spent uh, really dealing with uh, the root causes of how these chatbots come about in the first place? And that is lack of talent on the ground in schools, lack of, you know, people, ex specialists. And then the other thing is the whole stigma of, of dealing with mental wellness. Should, shouldn't that be where we are focusing on? I think we probably need to focus a little bit on mm. everything. Mm. Uh, it's true that uh, stigma is a big problem. I think it's important and probably COVID-19 was good if we can use that word uh, to kind of bring mental health a bit more mm. in the open and to say and to really sell, say to people like it's fine if you don't feel well, you know, you can talk about these things. Um, but also we know that uh, health professionals are not enough. Yep. Uh, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, etc. So we need other ways to treat a, a, a larger amount of the population. So if you're going to use chatbots, how are you going to design them? Do you want to make them extra humanoid or deliberately anti-humanoid? So for example, there is, and I can see your point, if I feel I'm not talking to a person, I am somehow just putting it mechanically into a mechanical diary, I might actually be more open about it. So there might be some function in making this less like a person and more like a machine. If you design for the future, how would you design the perfect chatbot well, for mental health issues? Mm, <laughs> that's a difficult question. But um, I would say it's important for the person to know that there's not a human on the other side because to also understand what are the limitations of the machine. Because obviously a machine cannot do as many things as a human, per, as, as a human can do. So I think it's important that, that it's, it's not, they, do, they know it's not a human first. Um, then uh, it's important that healthcare professionals are involved in the development. Um, probably it's important that there's more regulation around mm -hmm. what digital tools and digital health tools are out there. Um, the chatbots we uh, checked were all in the app store, so whoever can go to the app store can download these yeah. apps. There are some good apps, for example, like things like Wisa or Wobot. Wisa is usually is in the Mindline website in here in Singapore. But there are other apps that are not good. And, and if you look at those apps, they can even be dangerous. The problem is that at the moment, nobody is truly regulating the market. So everything is still out there. Yeah. yeah. All right, it's a, obviously a nascent science here. Well, thanks so much for this. Uh, mental health chatbots. We're talking about that with Dr. Laura Martinengo from the Lee Kong Chen School of Medicine in NTU. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.